century and a half after the Constitution abolished slavery and guaranteed blacks the right to vote, four decades after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, voters have chosen our first African American president. Praise the Most High, Elohim of Heaven. Shabbat Shalom family, it's your boy Solemn Prophet here with Professor S, Sister Jasmine, Sisters Tess and Cindy, and uh, Danny Amnesia may be in and out. Um, this week, a hey, part, what this, part four now? I think it's part four. Part four? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, man, we've been going through this series, this interesting series. We just finished up this um, extensive article on uh, a breakdown of Galatians chapter three, and we're gonna hit Galatians chapter three some more. Um, kind of beat a dead horse, but hey, listen, we need to get the full um, spectrum of understanding when it comes to the scriptures. So, with that being said, um, before we go ahead and begin, as we have been doing every episode, um, remember. When you go through any of Paul's epistles to maximize your amount of understanding that you're getting, you have to keep in mind, right? You have to, one, substitute sin. When you see the word sin, substitute that thing. For its biblical definition, First John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law, of the Torah, okay? When you see the word law, <laughs> substitute it for its correct context. If you don't know what law Paul is talking about, um, make sure you read the chapter as a whole, read the chapter before, maybe read the chapter after, maybe do a little bit of um, uh, Googling, right? And read some various commentaries on it. And you'll see, uh, you know, you'll see what, what law he's talking about. Cause he's not always talking about the law, the Torah. Sometimes he's talking about the law of the land. Sometimes he's talking about, um, the, the law, law of sin and death. The yeah. law of sin and death, exactly. So it's it's not always just the Torah. So you always want to make sure you do that. And then you always want to um, read Paul's epistles, his letters, any of his words, right? From his perspective. Not your perspective, not your pastor's perspective, not your elder's perspective, not your captain's perspective, okay? You want to read his words from his perspective and understand where he was coming from when he wrote what he wrote. Um, oftentimes we, we, we get caught up in the modern day breakdowns, the modern day interpretation, um, the religious um, spin that we put on it, the twisting, the twisting of scriptures and all of that. Um, and so we get away from it. It's a re original meaning, right? If somebody wrote a sentence you know, 7,000 years ago, and the sentence said the dog ran down the street. And then 7,000 years later, somebody said, no, it don't mean that. It, meant, it said the dog jumped over a fence. You can't read it from a dog jumped over a fence. Okay. The original writer said the dog ran down the street. So um, always understand from Paul's epistle. Look, I, I try to break it down is, is on a basic level because I, I think like that, right? Um, aside from his perspective, you always want to ask the question, what exactly does Paul mean when he's saying what he's saying? By asking that question, you you are like forcing yourself to go into detective mode, right? You flip the switch and you go from a passive reader to an investigator. And when you go into the detective mode and you begin your investigation of answering that question, what does Paul truly mean? It causes you to do a couple different things. Sometimes you read the book that you're in, and then you also go to some of his other epistles to see if those line up, right? Um, sometimes what you do is you see who's, who's, who Paul is quoting, and then you go to the original text to see exactly who he's quoting to make sure that you understand exactly, you know, what does he mean when he says that? Because Paul does talk, not quite a parable, but he speaks very vaguely in certain instances. And since he knows what he's talking about, he expects you to know what he's talking about. Kind of one of those things like when you when you hear somebody speak who's super highly intelligent and they just assume that everybody in a room whom they're speaking to is on their level intellectually. And so they're saying words and using phrases and all that stuff. And everybody looking around like, bro, like speak English to me. It's, it's kind of like that, right? 
Um, Professor S highlighted this um, beforehand and it was excellent. Paul was a student of what was, what's his name? Galangelio? Uh, Gam Gamliel or uh, Gamliel. Yeah. Right. Gamliel. And the way Professor S breaks it down is if you got high school, community college, four year university, high end, prestigious university, those are the various levels, right? The equivalent of that on the teachings, teaching of the Torah, right? Those various rabbis, the various teachers of the law. And uh, what's his name? Galangli? Galangliel. Galangliel, right? He was the highest level of prestige, right? So for Paul to be a student of his and to learn directly from him meant that Paul knew his stuff, right? So um, it's like Michael Jordan, like Michael Jordan becoming your personal coach in basketball, okay? Um, so since he knew that, that tells you his background. So he's not going to be coming from a basic perspective all the time. He's going to say some stuff that can go up your head. So you got to do your due diligence, put on that investigator's hat, and then figure out what he's talking about. Lastly, but not least, always understand that you got to look through the lens, not, not say look through the lens, but understand at the end of the day, the conclusion of the matter is that you got to keep the commandments. So keep Ecclesiastes 13 in your mind, in the back of your mind as you're going through this. Because when you do that, what that does is it provides a safety net to make sure you stay on track and that you don't go off the rails, right? Using all five of these steps is going to help you not only navigate through Paul's epistles, it's going to help you better understand Paul's epistles, it's going to better help you apply Paul's epistles, and then it's going to better help you be able to speak to those things as well. Like if you want to explain it to someone else, if you want to say, hey, this is what I learned, you'll be able to explain it from, from a perspective and from a way that other people will be able to understand, right? Because um, Paul's epistles aren't, are e aren't the easiest thing to understand to those who are unlearned and unstable. Right. If you don't know the Torah, you don't have a background in the Torah, it's really hard for you and really difficult for you to understand Paul's epistles. True. The true meaning of Paul's epistles, not the modern day, you know, understanding of what, his, what, what the epistle said. So um, with those things being said, um, if you like the content, like, share and subscribe. And let's go ahead and get right into it. Professor S, go ahead, yes. take it away, my brother. Yes, we I on? will. Uh... Share the screen here with uh, Galatians 3 pulled up on uh, eSword. So, um, right here it is. Yeah. And pulling up the side by side was a great idea, too, Rick, by the way. What's that? I said pulling up the side by side comparison was a um, oh, great idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because then, then, then you get to see, you know, you get the King James version with the uh, strong concordance numbers, and you've got the uh, scriptures 2009 version so uh, yeah good stuff so um yes. oh foolish galatians or oh senseless galatians as this version says who has put you under a spell or bewitched you and uh king james not to obey the truth now we know that the truth the torah is the truth right mm -hmm. so if he's saying and messiah is the truth messiah is also the word manifest in flesh so um, when it says that you should not obey the truth, your uh, discernment should be going up and you should be saying, hmm, well, what's the truth here, right? The Torah is the truth and Messiah is the, the, the living Torah become flesh, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so it's not telling you to forsake the Torah, right? It's telling you you should be thinking about obeying the truth, right? Um, before whose eyes Yahushua Messiah was clearly portrayed among you as impaled or crucified, right? This only I wish to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the Torah or by the hearing of belief? And that's, that's the thing. The spirit is what leads us into all righteousness, right? Um, but we receive that. We receive the spirit so that we can be led into righteousness. We, if, you know, you don't start off performing righteousness correct you have to receive the spirit first so he's saying did you receive the spirit by by doing the torah no you didn't because you can't do the torah without the spirit 
right? So here, here we've got a, a situation of putting the cart before the horse, right? Um, are you so senseless, having begun in the spirit, do you now end in the flesh? Have you suffered so much in vain, if indeed in vain? Is he then who is supplying the spirit to you and working miracles among you, doing it by works of the Torah or by the hearing of belief, right? So we're getting the, the spirit supplied to us by our faith, right? as uh, King James would render it, by the hearing of faith. Um, we don't receive the spirit by works of the Torah. Right? Yeah. Um, however, the works of uh, disobeying, disregarding the Torah can uh, quench the spirit. Uh, so, um, even so, Abraham did believe Elohim, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Genesis fifteen six. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, know then that those who are of belief are sons of Abraham. Um, and it's just saying, you know, if you believe, you are a son of Abraham, right? Let me, uh, let me, let me grab, let me, let me grab some commentary real quick. Um, yeah, the way I think of it, right, the way I simplify it and break it down to mm -hmm. the first, what, seven verses of Galatians chapter three. He's saying that, because remember who he's talking to. Paul is speaking to the people in that specific area at that specific time who wrote unto him issues that they were dealing with specifically okay that, that, that's another thing to think about paul's writings are letters that he wrote to specific areas so if he wrote a letter to arizona because arizona the state of arizona was dealing with certain issues a church that was in arizona they, their issues might be different from New Mexico or Texas or California, right? All of them are different areas and different churches dealing with different things. All of those letters are compiled and put in the Bible. But we're, we're reading the letters like, well, Paul said this, so, you know, this has to be it. And, it, and it's not necessarily always that. It's because he was addressing specific issues. That's the first thing. But the way I the way I understand the first seven verses is this. Imagine if. Let's uh, let's say let's use the military, right? I'm, I'm prior military. So let's use the military real quick. OK, so in order to become a military service member, you got to go through a bunch of stuff, right? Paperwork. But you got to go to boot camp. That's the main thing. You got to go to boot camp. Got to graduate through boot camp. Basic military training. BMT. Right. Now, once you get through boot camp, you're in the military. Once you're in the military, you have all of these different benefits and opportunities that are afforded to you once you're in the military. So what he's saying is the, the, the Galatians, they received by faith, <laughs> they received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is evidence of the Messiah. And as verse 7 says, you are now sons of Abraham because they are now brought into the promise that was made to Abraham by the Most High back in Genesis. That promise was an assurance of salvation through the covenant that was made between the Most High and through Abraham. So now they are made through their faith a part of that promise. They're, they're, they're grafted in the covenant, a part of that promise. But in order, but not in order, but that's part of it. You still also have the obedience factor at play, which is following what the Most High set forth, which is the law, which is the law, which is the Torah, which is his instructions, commandments, ordinances, etc., etc. Right? And it um this talks about because he's because remember like i said they read these letters and they say well paul said this and this is what it must mean right but scripture also states that abraham's faith wrought by his works which was accredited to him as righteousness and that's in james chapter 2 i think that's verse 20 
off the top of my head. I don't know for sure, but it's between verse 14 through 26. You should read verse 14 through 26 of James chapter two. Now, because Abraham wrought his faith by his works, he was he was deemed righteous by the most high. The Galatians, since they didn't have a foundation of Torah, they were they were heathen. They were considered, you know what I'm saying, outside of the covenant. By having faith, they were given the spirit. And now they have the opportunity to learn all of the things that someone who already was a part of the covenant by birth would have gotten, if that makes sense. So if you compare it to the military, receiving or well, having faith is saying you 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 want to go into the military okay and going to boot camp is receiving the holy spirit but you got to graduate boot camp to become a service member graduating boot camp is taking that extra mile it's the other half of the equation which is the law which is keeping the most highest law statutes and commandments but you can get in the door but once you're in the door, now you're you're held to a standard and you have to uphold that standard. Right. Once you get in the military, you're held to a higher standard than a regular civilian. You got to you know, you got to stay on your P's and Q's. You got to behave because if you if you make a mistake, it's a reflection of the entire um, branch of service that whatever branch of service you in. If you're in the Air Force, you, 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 you reflect the Air Force. If you're in the Army, you reflect the Army. That's why when people in the military make mistakes like get DUIs and do dumb stuff. They get hit with military charges and they get hit with civilian charges. It's crazy. But once you're in, you're now held to that higher standard and now you have to act accordingly. Once you receive the Holy Spirit through your faith, now it's time to say, okay, I am a son of Abraham. I am grafted into the promise. Now what do I do? That should be a question. Now what do I do? What the Jews at the time were trying to say was, okay, yeah, we, 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 we admit, we saw, we saw that we witnessed that you guys received the Holy Spirit like we received the Holy Spirit. But what about this law, though? You got to keep this whole law. And what Paul was trying to get the Jews to understand was, yes, they received the Holy Spirit, and yes, they will have to keep the law, but they don't know the law like you know the law. Give them time. Mm -hmm. And as they're trying to figure this out, I'm going to remain in contact with them and help them through this journey. I'm going to I'm going to raise up apostles to help teach. I'm going to plant those apostles in these various areas to be my, an extension of me because I'm an extension of Messiah. So if I'm an extension of Messiah, I'm going to send my emissaries to the various areas to help teach and edify. And if they have any issues, they're going to write to me and then I'm going to address their issues, which is what his epistles are. So they were dealing with specific issues, trying to figure this thing out, right? Trying to upgrade and graduate from sipping milk to chewing meat. And he was helping them. He was a doctor. Because a doctor, listen, if you go to the doctor for a headache, they're not going to tell you to put a Band-Aid on your toe. It has nothing to do with your headache, right? The doctor is going to prescribe you whatever he can that's going to directly address whatever your symptoms are. Now, I ain't, listen, that analogy ain't got nothing to do with Big Pharma. I know all about Big Pharma, so don't, don't go that way with me. But I'm just trying to break it down to a simple thing. Paul is giving a prescription in his letters to help the individuals who wrote to him first, because these letters are his response. We got to keep that in mind, too, to address specifically what they were dealing with. So they wrote to him, hey, Paul, we got this going on help us out and he wrote back all right i heard what you said in your letter i see what you're dealing with this is how you deal with it and we're now two three four five six whatever however many thousand years later now we're now reading that and saying what we wanted to say not as opposed to what it was originally saying so that's that's where i get from verses one through verses seven and he's basically saying you started in faith right you started in faith so you received the holy spirit why why would you now get caught up in what the Jews are trying to force on you, which is very carnal, very, very physical, and revert back? It's like 
You already graduated boot camp. You a service member. You in the military. Why are you trying to go back to boot camp? You don't need to go back through that. You already, you know what I'm saying? You already doing it. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, that's a great analogy, bro. So, um, yeah. So, and the, the scriptures, having foreseen that he would declare right the nations by belief, announced the good news to Abraham beforehand, saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. Still, that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Right? Um, because Abraham believed. See, Abraham didn't get the covenant by um, keeping the um, the contract, right? The um, the conditions. The conditions actually weren't even instituted until after he, he required or he said, he said, I want a, um, I want something to verify that this, this is going to be mine. Right. That's mm -hmm. when circumcision was, was then required. It wasn't required before then. Right. The covenant had already been made before circumcision, but he says, I want a token that I know on a notarized, um, a notarized contract saying, that yes, I will in fact my 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 descendants are gonna own this, right? And so the most high says, All right, I'll give you a notarized contract. Here it is, let's let's do this. And then now you're gonna have to start circumcising yourself as a token that you know that um that this is what's gonna happen, right? So the circumcision was a token of knowing that he was going to receive the covenant that had already been made, right? That he believed in. So um, for as many are as are of the works of the Torah are under the curse, for it has been written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all that has been written in the book of the Torah to do them. And that's Deuteronomy 27, 26. Um, mm -hmm. Cursed is he who does not establish the word of this Torah, and all yep. the people shall say amen, which is from uh, the, the blessings and curses on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so Paul would not be quoting from the Torah to say you're not supposed to keep the Torah. He's quoting from the Torah saying, look, you look, you, you need to keep this. Right. Um, he's saying right here, as many as are of works of the Torah are under the curse. So if you're counting on your works, if you're counting on your obedience of the Torah to save you, then you're under the curse because everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Everyone has committed sin. Everyone has gone their own way. That we've all erred and strayed. We've all broken the Torah. So once it's been broken, we there's 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 no possibility of obeying it enough to have not broken it before, right? You can't obey it enough to have never broken it if you've already broken it, right? No matter how much you start obeying it after you've broken it, it's still broken, right? So um, that's that's what he's saying here. He's saying that if you're if you're counting on your obedience to the Torah to save you, then you're under the curse because that's what the Torah says. The Torah itself says, you know, right. Um, but then and that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief or faith. And Habakkuk uh, two four, um, and the Torah is not of belief. But the man who does them shall live by them. Leviticus 18.5. Um, another quote from the Torah. So you see here Paul is, he's not saying don't keep the Torah. He's quoting the Torah and the prophets all through this, right? All through this. He's quoting the Torah and the prophets. Continuing on. Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. If the Torah was invalid, right, if we were no longer supposed to keep the Torah and the Torah didn't matter, then what's the point of this? What's the point of him even doing that? Because it's the Torah. That's the old, the old thing that doesn't matter anymore, right? It's something that's ironic. Even the sacrifice of the Messiah was in accordance to the Torah. Mm -hmm. And here's something even crazier. The Romans, in the way that they crucify 
they were following no such Torah. That was that was a pagan custom that they dealt they dealt with, right? Mm -hmm. But how crazy is it that even though their custom was pagan and not of the most high and how you know the, the Hebrews, the Israelites dealt with, you know, certain things, right? The Messiah sacrifice still fell into the category of observing Torah and going according to it because blessed, I mean, not blessed, cursed is the man who hang, hangeth on a tree. So even though it was too far, like far, so far to the right or too so far to the left, it still was in alignment with prophecy because prophecy had to still be fulfilled. And it, it even goes deeper than that. I'm not sure if I ever talked about it before about the, the various, um, the, uh, um, the 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 cup of bitter water for the um the uh unfaithful bride right oh the thigh rider mm, yep yep where where if a man suspects his his wife of uh adultery he takes her to the priest the priest writes mm -hmm. out all the curses blots it into the water then she drinks it and then the uh the curses that would happen to her if she was in fact um an adulterous bride right um that all was accomplished through the Messiah's crucifixion. Um, that's 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 a lot to unpack. Maybe we shouldn't go into that right now. I don't know. What do you think? It's a, it's a lot to unpack on that. Um, Listen, I'm um, down. We, let's, oh, you want to go through it? Okay. We, we um, are attacking every angle of Galatians chapter 3. So when we leave Galatians chapter 3 and go to chapter 4, we've left no, no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. We've left no yep. stone, no stone unturned. Okay, so, uh, okay, all right. Let's go to. Uh, you want me to? You want me to go to whatever you're trying to look up, and you just let me share my screen up here, so you, oh, you yeah. don't lose your place here. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll quit sharing my screen. I'll let you uh, share yours. Okay. Um, share it from, uh, you're going to share it from the, um, computer. Oh, there you go. Okay, yeah. cool. Great. So yeah, it's, uh, numbers chapter five. Um, uh, <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, Numbers chapter 5, let's see. Yeah, verse 12, starting at 12. Yes, that would be it. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. So, uh, speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, if a man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband and be kept close and she be defiled and there be no witnesses against her. See, she can't be put to death at this point because there's no witnesses. That's, that's, that's an important key as well. She can't be put to death. There's no witnesses. There have to be witnesses. Um, neither she be taken with the manner and the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and he be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled. So this is saying, if he's jealous and he thinks she's defiled, whether she is or not, this is what you do, right? Um, so then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest and he shall bring her offering for her, the 10th part of an eva of barley meal. He shall pour no oil on it, nor put frankincense thereupon, for it is an offering for of jealousy, an offering of uh, memorial bringing iniquity to remembrance right and the priest shall bring her near and set her before Yahweh and the priest shall take the holy water in an earthen vessel and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle the priest shall take and put it in the water and the priest shall set the woman before the most high and cover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hand which is the jealousy offering, and the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water 
that causeth the curse, right? So this, we're dealing with curses once again. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, if no man hath lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causes the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man hath lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Most High, make thee a curse and an oath among thy people. When the Most High doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that curses and the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen. So she says, let it be. So then she goes and drinks it. Um, and then if and it uh, goes on to say, um, makes her drink the water, verse 27, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and hath done trespass against her husband, that the water that causes the curse shall enter her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free, and she shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies, when a wife goes aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled. For when the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Most High, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. So if her belly swells and her thigh rots, and the word rot there actually just means waste away, right? Um, so and I don't know exactly what would happen. Maybe her legs would become feeble. I don't know. But the, the word there actually means like to waste away or um, so decay, to, to stop working properly, right? So right. her thighs would become weak, I guess. Um, and her belly would swell up. And then she would, everyone that saw her would know, hey, look, she, she can hardly walk and she's got a swollen belly. She's, uh, she's done something and she drank that water and look what happened to her, right? So then she becomes a proverb amongst her people, and um, a, and everyone that sees her knows what she did, right? Um, so that's the curse of the adulterous bride, right? So if if you have no witnesses, you can't prove anything, but you suspect that your wife has done something, there you go. Now, what happened here, um, what we have here, that is the penalty for a woman who has committed adultery. Now we know from multiple um, multiple analogies in the prophets that Israel played the harlot, right? Uh, yep. Both both Israel and Judah, when you take the northern and southern kingdoms, they both played the harlot, right? Neither one of them was, was innocent of, of, of this. They were always going after false gods, whoring with other gods, right? Um, for, for, for clarification purposes, for those who are watching this that aren't paying attention, well, not paying attention, but don't, don't necessarily know this, over and over and over again in the scriptures, Israel as a whole, to include Israel and to include Judah, were considered the bride of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, when you really look into it, you find out it's the Messiah. So it's the bride of the Messiah, right? Israel is personified as a woman. That's 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 where he's going with it. Yep, yep. So, so the bride is Israel, right? Then that would include those who are native born and those who are grafted in to the olive tree, right? Um, that is the bride of Messiah. And so, with the bride having gone astray and defiling herself, right? Now, a woman can be defiled if she lays with a man before she's married and, and the marriage is consummated. And she also is defiled if she goes and um, and commits adultery after she's been married. Both of those things defile a woman, right? Um, we find that uh, all through the Torah. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you take, in this case with, uh, with the Galatians, they were Gentile, so they were not already set to be married to Messiah. So they were not already in the covenant but yet they were defiled beforehand because they were worshiping false gods before. So they're just as defiled as Israel was for going to worship false gods after 
being in the covenant. So regardless whether you're a native born or you're uh, grafted in, you've still been defiled. And so the um, consequence of that is your belly has to swell and your thighs have to rot. However, um, the husband, whenever a woman commits a sin worthy of death, um, the husband can choose to take it onto himself. The husband is basically responsible for his woman, right? Now, if it's worthy of death, he can let her be put to death and not, not have to suffer that, or um, he can choose to do that for her, right? Now, with the, the case of this right here, where the belly has to swell and thighs have to rot, um, Messiah, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was praying and he says, let this cup pass from me. If, it, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, right? And most people would say, oh, that's the cup of the anguish he's about to endure, right? And, and that, that could very well be part of it, right? But uh, it seems that this is talking about the, uh, the cup of the adulterous, adulterous bride, where the, the curses have been blotted out into the cup. And in order for his bride to not have to suffer that, he has to take it on himself because that's the responsibility of a husband. If the husband doesn't want his wife to have to go through what she, what she has earned for herself, then he has to take it to himself. So Messiah was saying, let this pass from me if it's possible. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Um, in order for the bride to be spotless, Every punishment that she was supposed to receive had to be exacted on either her or husband, i.e. Messiah, right? Um, and so he had to take this. Uh, during crucifixion, uh, regardless of how the crucifixion is done, whether your arms are out or whether they're up above or whatever the case is, um, because uh, lots of people are, oh, he wasn't crucified that way. It was this way or whatever. It doesn't. In this particular instance, it doesn't matter how the crucifixion was done. Whenever you're crucified, um, you have, to, in order to be able to breathe, you have to lift yourself up because when you're hanging with your arms up or whatever, whenever you're hanging, it collapses your lungs and you can't breathe um, unless you get yourself up. Now, most people would assume you have to pull yourself up and you, and, and you do have to do that too. But the majority of the effort actually comes from pushing with your feet, right? So pushing with your feet is what really gets your body lifted up to where you can breathe. And then once you take a breath, you fall back down again because, you know, you got this tremendous weight on your hands that are nailed through, right? Um, so in order to breathe, you basically have to do squats. Um, I don't know. I don't know. People maybe are familiar with going to the gym or not, but um, if someone could imagine doing squats for hours straight, um, you would literally be ripping apart all of the fibers in your thighs. Like all the muscle fibers in your thighs would literally be ripping apart. Um, so yeah, his, his thighs were wasting away when that was happening, but also because of the position and the way the body is and with the uh, limited amount of breathing and the extensive um, uh, uh, exertion of the muscles, it also, crucifixion also causes all the fluids in the stomach or in the, in the body, all the fluids in the body pool in the stomach. And so the, the stomach actually swells up whenever someone's crucified. Um, you don't, in depictions, you don't really get that, but there, there, there are a few um, depictions of crucifixions where you'll notice that the belly is like really big, almost looks pregnant, right? Um, so essentially that's what would happen. Your belly would swell and your thigh would rot. Um, when being crucified. So even the Romans through their, their, their pagan execution practice were still fulfilling that aspect of the Torah right there. Um, and it's just, it's just mind blowing how all of these, all of these things in the Torah were being fulfilled and um, taken away from us because we rightly deserve, right? We rightly deserve to have these things done to us, but uh, instead he took it all to him. Um, so wow. 
so profound. Um, it almost every time I think about that, I, I get a little choked up. Um, anyways, so just another example of how the Torah is being fulfilled and how when Paul is quoting from the Torah here, he's not saying don't keep the Torah. He's quoting from the Torah because he wants you to keep it, right? Um, because we were we were pardoned for not keeping it. I, I know I've probably given this analogy before on Shabbat talk, probably multiple times, but I'll go I'll go ahead and give this analogy one 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 last time. Um, if you were if you were speeding, you're caught going 75 in a 35, right? You're and the police sees you, pulls you over. He says, "Man, you were going 75 in a 35." I mean, technically, he could take you to jail for that, right? That's reckless driving, right? Um, yeah. But he says, he says, well, I know, I know you were late for work or whatever. There's not much traffic. You didn't, you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give you a warning, right? Um, you're going to be like, so thankful that you got grace, right? You're going to be so thankful that you got grace from that officer. You're going to probably go exactly the speed limit or even under the speed limit the rest of the way. Right. You'd be like, man, I could have just gone to jail. I could have gotten a huge fine for reckless driving. But he was so nice. He he gave me a warning. He took that away, took that ticket and ripped it up and said, all right, sorry. You're, and he says, sorry, you know, I'm going to I'm going to let you slide on this one. Right. Um, so you're not going to peel off and start going 80 miles an hour. <laughs> are you? No, no. You're going to you're going to say, oh, man, thank you. And, and so that's, that's how it is, you know, when Messiah gives us grace by taking that for us, right? Um, and, le and let's say the officer that pulled you over, he was like, man, I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I'm still going to let you go, right? So he, he decides he's willing to take, take the heat when his boss, when, when his captain or whoever says, hey, why didn't you give a ticket to that person? You should have given that fool a ticket, Right. And he's, but he says, I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I'm still going to let you go just because I understand your situation. Right. Mm. Um, even, yeah. even, let me add on to you. Yeah. You driving reckless, 75 and 35, right? Mm -hmm. Pulls you over. So I'll probably get in trouble, but I'm going to let you go. What do we do? We speed the hell off and go 85, and then we get into a car wreck. And now we're injured. We injured somebody else. There's property damage involved. We find out and identify that we were previously pulled over for speeding and that officer <laughs> didn't, didn't, you know, take us in mm -hmm. beforehand. So that backlash, that, 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 that additional backlash and downward spiral occurred because he didn't, he gave us, you know, gave us that grace. So now he's extremely held accountable by his superiors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, so then at that point, I would I would venture to say that whatever we were supposed to get in that situation um, would probably be the fine that he'd get. They'd be like, man, what the heck was wrong with you? Right. So um, you, you can take that analogy. But what we should do with that, what we should do is say, man, you're right. I did I was wrong. Now, I was wrong to, to, to break the law. I was wrong to break the law. By rights, I'm under the curse of the law. I'm under the penalty. You have the right to give me the fine and call me off to jail, right? But because you chose not to, I'm going to I'm going to be so grateful for that that I'm going to drive the speed limit, maybe even a little less the rest of the way for for the rest of the week, maybe even the rest of you know maybe the rest of my life I'm going to be like, oh man, I can't believe he was so nice to me. I'm the rest of my life I'm going to drive the speed limit, right? Mm -hmm. And so that that's essentially in this analogy, the speed limit would be the Torah, the law, right? And um, because we were given grace, we're not supposed to use that as an occasion to sin. You know, do we continue in sin because of because of faith? Uh, God forbid, right? Elohim forbid. No, we don't. We establish the law. We can we we start to keep the law, just like just like how the 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 Holy Spirit, the Ruach Hakodesh, uh, convicts us convicts us of sin and righteousness, right? So when we receive the Ruach, we're going to start to become convicted, right? It's not through our obedience that we become good enough, but um, it's through our belief that we're given the ability to continue 
um, being convicted and going the right the right way, right? The correct path. So a little, uh, little rabbit trail there, but uh, <laughs> no, much much needed, bro. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Much needed. Um, no stone so, unturned. Yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's just so much we can unpack in this, uh, in this chapter. Uh, we will probably need a couple of parts for chapter four as well. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, I suppose. Um, so, um, on chapter or verse fourteen, in order that the blessing of Abraham oh, might oh, no. come upon the nation. Screen. I'm sorry, what? You gotta go back and share your screen. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> oh, my bad. Okay. There we go. Everyone can see it now? Yep, it's up there oh. now. Good. So, uh, verse 14. In order that the, well, I'll start back at 13 just to complete this, the, the thought. Um, Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. So, he received the curse of hanging on a tree. He received the curse of the adulterous bride, his thighs rot and his belly swell. He received all the curses from the Torah onto himself so that we would not have to receive those. Being that he is our husband, he can choose to take the responsibility for us to do that, right? So, in order that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the nation in Messiah, Yahusha, to receive the promise of the Spirit through belief, right? So through faith, we receive the promise of the Spirit. Brothers, as a man, I say it, a covenant, even though it is a man's covenant, a man's, yet if it is confirmed, no one sets it aside or adds to it. Right? This is, uh, this is key, because if a covenant is confirmed, no one sets it aside or adds to it. Right? Um, right here, brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth to it, right? So no man is going to add to or take away, just like the just like the Torah says. Uh, but the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to his seed, who is Messiah. So. The seed that is being referred to, and that's 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 why you know, man, that realization I had um, last week or the week before about yeah. oh my goodness profound stuff but about when it about um when you when you're someone's son you do as your father did yeah yeah yep. because because in, in in Hebrew thinking a son has the attributes of his father. And if he doesn't have the attributes of his father, then he's not his son. He can be he can be um um disowned, disinherited, right? If he doesn't have the attributes of his father, right? Um now this I say, Torah that came four hundred and thirty years later does not annul a covenant previously confirmed by Elohim in Messiah. So as to do away with the promise. Um, hang on just a second, bro. I got to, uh, I'll be right back. Give me just a moment. Give me just a moment. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. So what is it? What's it saying? And verse 17 says, it does not annul a covenant previously confirmed by Elohim in Messiah. So as to do away with the promise. And then in the KJV, it says, and this I say, the covenant that was confirmed before of Elohim in Messiah, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. There is various covenants throughout the scriptures. Each covenant that was made never took away from the previous covenant. It never took away from the previous covenant. It never, what's it called, disannulled the previous covenant. It always, each covenant before it, always stood as the foundation. 
And when the new covenant was instituted, it was just a new covenant adding to it, right? It never, you don't, you don't do away with the, with the covenant and you don't change a covenant. You just either like, like if, if we set an agreement and we say Shabbat talk will be every Friday and it'll be at least 30 minutes long. And that's the agreement and the covenant that we come up with. If later on we, we want to, you know, change some things or not, not even necessarily change some things. If we want to do some something new, right? Like, I don't know, make the show longer or whatever the case may be. Or do, or do it do three times a week it. instead of one. Correct. We have to establish that, but it, we can't go outside the confines of the original agreement, right? So... If the original agreement was at least 30 minutes, we can't now say, oh, no, we're going to cut it down to 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because we're, we're, we'd be breaking that first original agreement, which symbolizes the covenant. Now, we could say we can go longer because we said originally we would do at least 30 minutes. Or we could do it on Friday. Also, we could do it on Saturday and on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's not breaking the original confines. And so that's what covenants are and it's saying if a man's covenant like a covenant between me and you right if if you don't you don't change that you don't do away with it you don't add to that within the covenant how much more so a covenant from elohim to man or a covenant that just consists of elohim yeah and right? absolutely so it's, Absolutely. It's yes. It's, 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 it's even more. I mean, we're dealing, we're dealing with the most high. We're not dealing with just men, right? So it's 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 even more um important to be um recognizing that we don't just do away with anything in the covenant. We don't um with 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 le covenant levels, each level of covenant that you enter into it um it increases the it increases the um oh, what do you call it? It, it it increases the benefit of the covenant because there's benefits and responsibilities in a covenant like we make we we have right. a responsibility and we also have the benefit to us right so it benefits me it it's benefits both parties generally in the covenant and generally, in the covenant, both parties have responsibilities to uh, perform in order to maintain the covenant. Yeah. Now, what had, what had actually happened? Um, so what had actually happened was the ultimate covenant was made with Abraham and his seed, right? With the seed, which is Messiah. That's the ultimate covenant was made with Messiah, right? The ultimate covenant was made with Messiah. But once we broke the covenant, once Israel broke the covenant, it had to begin again. It had to start over with um, the lowest level of the covenant you can be in. And then you had to work um, through establishing your um, trustworthiness. You would go on to the next level, right? When Messiah came, though, and took away all the curses... You no longer had to go through all the various levels of the covenant in order to be established in the covenant. Just like with Abraham, he was already in the full fullness of the covenant. Right? Um, and um, Messiah was the one that took the, the penalty for the covenant being broken. Um, so with, with us, we receive the fullness of the covenant through Messiah because he's taken all of the curses. It doesn't mean that we just forsake the whole, all the requirements, right? We don't forsake the requirements, but the requirements of the covenant don't come first. It's like if you go to get married, right? Um, and you uh, you you decide you're you're getting ready to get married, and you make out your vows, and let's say um, let's say each each party makes out what they. They, they write down what they will give to the other and what they expect from the other, right? So let's say the husband writes down, he expects his wife to um, uh, bear him children and um, take care of uh, take care of the, the household and um, 
watch the children, right? And that's what he expects. And in exchange for that, he is going to supply all the financial needs, maintain the finances, supply the food that she will be preparing, et cetera, et cetera. So he provides, she, and she provides, right? And they've they've made this, this agreement, right? Well, before you go in and get married, you're not gonna be like, well, you're not doing it yet. So, because the requirements, the benefits and the requirements are when the covenant is established. That's when the requirements become necessary, right? So you don't go and be like, well, you haven't been, you haven't been cooking, you haven't had children yet, um, so I guess I'm just not going to marry you. No, you get married first, so you establish the covenant first, then you move on to um, learning and learning how to keep the requirements properly, right? Um, you, you you don't demand your future spouse before you even enter into the covenant to do those things, right? You enter the covenant, then those things come after. It's, it's once again, it's putting the cart before the horse, you know? Yeah. Even, even with, um, the, the understanding of the new Testament, so-called doing away with the laws. And one of the easiest or quickest references they use for such doing away with is talking about us not sacrificing animals anymore. And I've given this analogy, y'all y'all getting jam-packed with analogies today, but I've given this analogy in some of my other uh, videos explaining Paul's epistles. But the reason why we're not, I ain't going to say we're not required to, the reason why we don't sacrifice animals anymore is because when you were to do, when you were to do a sacrifice, hey, be quiet, when you were to do a sacrifice, you had to you had to select an animal that was perfect. It had to be without blemish, right? And there was a certain procedure and process to doing so, right? But with Messiah being without sin and being considered Elohim and in an eternal being, right? Sacrificing himself, you're not gonna get a more perfect sacrificial animal than that right so not only is he more perfect than anything you can produce with your bare hands or anything you can go out and hunt or catch or whatever the case may be he's eternal so the requirement of the law for sacrifice has never stopped it's always going to continuously on go but because Messiah is eternal himself, he's consistently meeting that requirement for us. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to necessarily go and grab an animal, slit his throat, go through the process and, and, and go through that sacrifice for our sin. So the analogy is if we're out at dinner, there's Applebee's, you know, chilies, whatever your favorite, you know, I would say red lobster, but everything in there is unclean. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, but you know, you get what I'm saying. We out to dinner and we get done with the meal and the waiter walks by and we're like, hey, waiter, you know, we're ready for our check. And then a the waiter goes, oh, you don't have to worry about the check because the gentleman over at the bar, um, you know, he, he saw you guys pray over your food. He was touched or maybe he saw one of you guys in a military uniform and he, he was touched and, and saying, thank you for your service. He, he, for whatever the reason is, the gentleman over at the bar paid for your meal. So you don't have to worry about uh, the check. So just because we didn't pay for our meal, right? We all out at, at dinner, we eating. Just because we didn't pay for our meal does not negate the fact that that establishment, that, that, that company, that restaurant has to receive payment rendered for their services. For the food that they provided, for the service that they provided, they need payment they need restitution we don't pay it because it was already paid but that requirement never stopped it's not like the restaurant when we walked through the door the restaurant was like oh you guys are so awesome you're not here yeah, listen everything is on the house no 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 payment still needed to be made someone else just made the payment and that's how you look at it with the tour yep. payment requirement of sacrifice still needs to be made 
It's just that the Messiah, he, he, met, he met that need, that requirement for sacrifice. And he's continuously meeting that requirement for sacrifice. So to say that, you know, oh, I believe the law is done away with because we don't deal with animal sacrifice no more. That's in the Old Testament. We don't do that no more. It's not a, it's not a valid argument at all whatsoever. Even though we're what, what people consider that we're in the New Covenant, we're in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The New Testament never did away with anything in the Old Testament. A New Covenant, a new, it, I don't even really like the word New Covenant. I, I prefer... The, the the phrase renewed covenant mm -hmm. because the covenant was already made we broke the covenant and through messiah and his sacrifice fulfilling the prophecy, so that we could so renew us to be, to be re regrafted into the fold mm -hmm. and he restored that connection of the covenant between us as mankind the most high's creation and the most high himself through whom the mo it's like it's almost like we're the bride, the Messiah is the husband, the most high is the is the is the is the, is the father of the bride. The Messiah paid the bride price, which is Torah. This is all Torah here, paid the bride price for the wife. We were adulterous. The husband paid, he instead of making us pay for our sins, he paid for it. And he reestablished that connection between because when listen. We ain't mentioned this tonight, but like um, he um, Joe mentioned another one of the ways that a, a wife is defiled. He mentioned the whole being adulterous and, you know, the belly swelling and a thyrotic. But the other one is if if she is defiled before the marriage and the man suspects it, and that's called the tokens of virginity. That's also in um, the Torah, where if the man suspects his wife of not being a virgin when they are when it got married, he can um, accuse her by going back to the priest, going back to the elders, and then they would they would contact the father. The father would then go and grab the marital bed sheets and bring it as a token of her virginity. If he opens those bed sheets and there's no blood, then that means that she wasn't a virgin, and she's brought in front of her father's house, not her husband's house, in front of her father's house and stoned to death, so that everybody knows that she dishonored her father's house. So the stuff that we do as the bride is bringing dishonor to our father. But instead of us being killed, the Messiah was killed in our place because that was his duty as a husband and his obligation, his choice, but he chose it, right? And in doing so, he reestablished that connection between us and the father because a, an adulterous daughter dishonors her father and he can disown her. He can disown her. So that whole situation was restored between us and, and 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 the Most High through the Messiah. Yes, yes. Oh, so 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 beautiful, man. Very very well said. Um, yeah, yeah. So rather than being disowned and left left to die in our sins, um, we were given the option of repenting and believing and once we believe and repent then we are filled with the holy spirit that then convicts us concerning sin and righteousness and then we start desiring not to sin i.e break the torah anymore so, yeah wonderful absolutely <clears throat> all praises man all praises I was telling Danny earlier, man, I got to get back in the Gospels. Every time I go back to the Gospels and read them, the more understanding of Torah that I receive, the more understanding of, you know, the spiritual spiritual realm and the esoteric understanding that I receive, the more Messiah's actions and his words become even more increasingly profound. And it just blows my mind. But yeah, absolutely. So far, um, anybody got any questions, any concerns? While we have a brief intermission, anything kind of eye opening or from anybody? That was beautiful. I love the way it was explained. Thank you, thank you, brothers. No worries.
And here's the here's the kicker. Here's the funny thing. Paul, Paul is way more versed in this stuff than me and Joe. Yeah. <laughs> and he writing this stuff. So like, even as we saying some stuff that sounds kind of deep, Paul's like, yeah, that's just scratching the surface. Like, yeah, you can go way deeper than that. Like, you can go more and more, right? Like, that's just, that's, just, that's the funny thing about it is like, there's so much to unpack. There's so many things. I told, like, I was telling, I was talking to Danny earlier, and um, I was like, bro, you can read one chapter in the Bible, one, a hundred different times, and still miss something. So if that's just one chapter of of a book just one chapter of a book and you got so many books in the scriptures and that's just the 66 that's not including the other scriptures outside of the Bible, right like you can spend your whole life studying this thing and still not get everything that you would necessarily like to get you're gonna get what you're meant to get but you it might not be what you initially set out to get that's why like reading the bible from cover to cover is that's really so, that's just really so you can say you did it, right? That was why I did it the first time. When I did it the first time, I was like, yeah, I just want to be able to say I read the whole Bible. And then the second time, it happened by, it just happened by coincidence because a lot of the research that I was doing over those, you know, few years literally took me to all the various books at some point again. And then that's when I did it again. But the second time I did it, it was like, Man, I missed a lot of stuff this that first go round, and then it became like, why? Do, I'm not worried about reading. You will never ever, and I'll tell you this as a promise: you will never ever see me talk about. I want to read the Bible from cover to cover. I'm gonna just start in Genesis and read it all the way through the Revelation because it don't work like that. Reading, you need to you need to read certain areas to get certain understanding, and that might connect you. You might read something in Genesis that might connect you to to Thessalonians, and then Thessalonians back to Deuteronomy and Deuteronomy to Ezekiel. All on one different topic. It does not make sense for you to constantly try to say, well, I want to read the whole the whole book all the way through. You'll get there. You'll read the whole book, but you'll you'll read it as a as a byproduct, not the goal. But yeah, I was just really just killing time till you came back, bro. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Uh sorry about that. I'm back. So, anyways, um, uh, now this I say, Torah, that came 400 years or 430 years later, does not annul a covenant previously confirmed by Elohim in Messiah. So it was confirmed in Messiah, Abraham's seed, right? Mm -hmm. So as to do away with the promise. The promise was given before the covenant was entered into, right? So um, it, it doesn't get rid of the promise, right? Bef before the requirements were given, the promise was already given. In other words, um, for if the inheritance is by Torah, it is no longer by promise. Right? Mm. But Elohim gave it to Abraham through a promise. Okay. Right? So, because if if you're required to keep the Torah in order to receive the promises that were given to Abraham, then it's no longer a promise. It's conditionary, right? Um, why then the Torah? It was added because of transgression until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained through messengers in the hand of a mediator. The mediator, however, is not of one, but Elohim is one. Mm. Is the Torah then against the promises of Elohim? Let it not be. King James again says, uh, God forbid, right? Yep. For if the Torah... Had If a Torah had been given that was able to make alive, truly righteousness would have been by the Torah, right? But the scripture has shut up all mankind under sin, that the promise of belief in Yahushua Messiah might be given to those who believe. It's given to those who believe, right? Belief is the foundation of it all. Yep. The foundation of it all is belief. You cannot... It's just like Messiah gave the uh, the parable of the man who uh, built the house on sand and built the house on a rock, right? Yeah. One guy builds it on the sand, one builds it on a rock. Now, if you're, you could look at it this way. Um, if the foundation of your um, your house is keeping the Torah, but you've already broken it, then you have no foundation to build on. It's it's essentially on the sand, right? Yeah. But 
if your foundation is on the promises of Elohim, mm -hmm. then you're going to build on that and you're, and you're going to build your house better and better by following the instructions, right? Yep. By following the instructions that he gave you, i.e. the Torah, you're going to build your house better and better and maybe remodel it and fix it up and 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 eventually you'll have a you'll have a nice uh, a nice fortress there, you know what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. built on the foundation of the promises, right? Um it's built on the foundation of faith and belief in the promises. But before belief came, we were given or we, we were being guarded under Torah, having been shut up for the belief being about to be revealed. Therefore, the Torah came, uh, became our trainer unto Messiah in order to be declared right by belief. And after belief has come, we are no longer under the trainer. So we no longer have the trainer... Um, you know, if, if we could use the analogy of a schoolmaster back in the day, you know, they'd walk around mm -hmm. with their ruler, and if you were doing something wrong, they'd swat your hand, right? Back in the day, you get your you get your knuckles swatted with a ruler, um, <laughs> <laughs> right? So we no longer have the 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 teacher coming by and swatting your knuckles with the ruler and we'll goof up, right? But it doesn't mean that uh, we don't do what we were taught, right? Analogy alert. Yep, analogy. <laughs> analogy alert just because this version the ts 2009 says trainer mm -hmm. right if you get a new job and you don't know nothing about that job because the job said they will train you so they're going to teach you how to properly carry out your duties of that position of that job right once you finish that training you you're on your own right because you know how to do it you've been trained if you don't follow the steps, the you procedure that was given to you in, in the training, you will get fired. <laughs> so you're like, hey, look, we, we, we don't need your services anymore. Goodbye. Go find a different job. <laughs> so when your job trains you, after you're done with the training, you don't just brain dump everything that you learned in the training. You need that information to continuously do the job correctly so that you don't get fired. It's not like the job is like, all right, we trained you, you got the training, now go do whatever you want. Yeah. No, it was setting a standard. It was establishing a routine and a pattern to teach you the proper steps and procedures to go and be successful. But once you get that and you're done with it, you need to go and be successful by keeping that. You know what I'm saying? So the law was a schoolmaster. It was a trainer. But when you're done with the, when you're done being, you know, trained, you don't just throw it all away you keep it up mm -hmm. and and i think it's also important here to, to recognize that paul has shifted here from uh talking about gentiles coming into the covenant to um jews who were raised in the covenant he shifted there when he talks about the 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 the, the torah being the schoolmaster he's saying it, it was a schoolmaster for the jews to yeah. bring them to belief in messiah whereas exactly. Belief in Messiah brings the Gentiles to the Torah, right? Correct, correct. Uh, so he's he's shifted who he's who he's talking about now at this point. Just uh, uh, some something I think we should make note of here. Yep, because the uh, Jews are supposed to be meant to be the example to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So it's important to make that that clarification for for Paul to make that clarification to them, so that they could potentially better understand where he was coming from. Remember, I always ask the question: What does Paul mean when he say this? Right. What's he talking about here? Because when, when when he's talking about the Torah here, if if he's talking to Gentiles and he says, "Well, the Torah was was here to, to bring us, uh, it was our trainer to bring us unto Messiah, right? Our trainer, who's our? Is he talking about the the audience he's writing to, or is he talking about him and and the other Jews, his people, right? His people according to the flesh. That's who he's talking about. Our trainer, not your trainer." our trainer right so um he shifted that he was talking about the jews at that point so um yep for ye are all sons of elohim through belief in messiah yahusha for as many of you as were immersed into messiah have put on messiah there is not yahudi a jew nor greek 
There is not slave nor free. There is not male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Yahusha. Now, basically, he's saying you're all you're all equal. You know, um, and if you are if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Right. The promise, um, the foundation the promise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that was and, set forth. And and what makes a promise? What gives a promise any validity? A promise only has validity when it's believed, when someone has faith in it, right? Yeah. Okay, so, for example, a check. Someone writes a check um, for 100 bucks, right? Someone writes a check for 100 bucks. That check is essentially a promise, right? Um, now, you get a check for 100 bucks from from a guy that uh, has five houses and um, is – extremely wealthy and you know the guy's wealthy he's loaded and he gives you a check for 100 bucks you're you're, you're going to believe that promise right you're going to believe in that promise because mm -hmm. you know that you know that he's got he's got the means to back it up right whereas um someone who's a flim flam some homeless guy who's a flim flam not, not even homeless but someone who's a flim flam never has always always um Always begging for money, never has never never has money for anything. Always bouncing checks. Someone who's known for bouncing checks all the time gives you a yeah. check for a hundred bucks. Um, you're not going to believe that check. You're not going to believe that promise, right? You're going to be yeah. like, man, this guy's always bouncing checks. I don't know if I can trust this. You know what I'm saying? And you take that to the bank. Uh, the bank's going to look at that guy's, and let's let's say it happens to be the same bank. That he banks with, they're going to look at that and say, oh, well, he doesn't actually have enough to cover this. And they're going to be like, sorry, we can't cash his check for you. Right. Um, so, so what, what makes a promise really, a promise depends on faith in the party who's being promised. Right. Um, on, on the, on the part of the party who's being promised. So the person who's receiving the promise has to have faith in order for that promise to really even matter. But then again, um, that person has the faith is not necessarily in the promise, but it's in the person giving the promise, right? Exactly. So when the Most High makes a promise, you know that he he can back it up, right? He can mm -hmm. back up any promise that he makes. Um, so you should have that faith and belief in his promise because you know that he can back it up. Whereas on a... Um, here, apparently, the uh, the Galatians, the Gentiles in Galatia, were being told that uh, they needed to do their part first before they could receive the promise, right? Right. Um, but then that negates the faith. That negates the faith. If they feel like they have to do something in order to receive the promise, then what what good is faith? And that's what Paul is talking about through this whole chapter. He's talking about what, what about faith? Faith is what's important. Belief is what's important. That's how you receive the Ruach HaKodesh. It's not by keeping the terms of the covenant that you receive the promises of the covenant. But you can, however, um, through disobedience, lose the promises of the covenant but that's a, a, a whole different topic i suppose give me give me one second again, bro. i'm sorry I know, we are finished was... with the chapter uh, give me one second if you want to make any commentaries i will be right back man yeah that was beautiful man that was oh, that, well, thank, thanks i'm 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 really glad it was good. all praises to the most high like he, like he's like like um the scripture said right if if it's a man's covenant how much more so is it looked at if it's the most co most highest covenant? So if a man with five houses and six cars gives you a check for hundred dollars, if you're gonna have faith in that, how much more so faith are you gonna have in a check or a promise from the Most High Himself? And and you know Paul's breakdowns, although it's all over the place and very hard to discern, that's basically what he's saying in placing the emphasis on on faith. So um. With that being said, family, um, that that brings us to the end of the chapter here. Mm -hmm. um, any questions, comments, concerns? Anything that you guys maybe be fuzzy on that you need elaborated on? 
Anything come to mind? Discussion wise, anything? No, I just appreciate the analogies with today's lesson because it really broke down and helped me understand it. Oh, great. Okay. As we're going through, are you guys like, number one is like a sin. Okay, number two, law. Number three, what's his perspective? Number four, I'm asking the question. Number five, okay, keep the Ecclesiastes in my mind. Are y'all kind of doing that as we go through it? Because as I'm reading, I'm looking, I'm looking for the keywords, but I'm also asking the question and looking at it from from his perspective. But I'm doing it because I've done it for a while, so I'm doing it internally, and and through my through my mental process, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes, like when I first started it, I had to have those written down, and as I was reading, I had to constantly look over and reference, like, okay, am I doing that? Okay, okay, am I doing that? Am I doing that now? It's just kind of more of an automatic process, but yeah, are you guys? You've gotten to the unconscious competence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, bro, I am. Like, I seriously have been making notes like the entire time you guys have been talking just because I'm making sure I'm making sure I just I need to be making sure I'm keeping tour properly. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing like. But the, emphasis, it's been the emphasis still needs to be on the faith. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Exactly. Because because it's the faith that causes you to want to keep the Torah properly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly, bro. Thank you. It's all praises. All praises. Thank you, guys. Uh, another another thing, uh, if you don't mind, just uh, just to, to to clarify another something, um, faith. Let's let's actually look it up here. Um, and well, uh, I I think this really like brings brings us all home, right? So faith, right? Here is the word faith in Greek, and um, let's see, moral conviction of religious truth or truthfulness of God or a religious teacher, especially reliance upon Messiah for salvation. Uh, abstractly, consistently in such profession by extension, system of religious uh, truth itself, assurance, belief, belief, faith, fidelity, right? Fidelity. Oh, what's that? Fidelity? Hmm. Um, now, let's go here. Let's see. Firm conviction, ground of belief, guarantee, assurance, good faith. Honesty, integrity, faithfulness, truthfulness in the New Testament, faith in God and Christ, um, the matter of the gospel faith. Let's see here. Uh, let's go to King. Oh, that's that's that. Uh, let's go to Thayer's uh, definition here, real fast. Conviction of the truth of anything, belief. So conviction of the truth. So when you have faith, you believe the truth, right? Um. Or you believe that what you that that it's true, right? Belief in the New Testament, a conviction or belief re, uh, respecting man's relationship to God and divine things, generally with the included idea of trust and holy fervor, born of faith and joined with it, relating to God, the conviction that God exists and is the Creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through Messiah. Relating to Messiah, a strong and welcome conviction of belief that Yahusha is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. The religious belief of Christians, uh, belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence. See, that's what faith really is. It's about trust, right? Whether in God or in Messiah springing from faith in the same fidelity faithfulness the character of one who has been who can be relied on someone who can be relied on uh support i've uh read another it's not on here i guess but uh somewhere else uh that basically and and through this you, you could also say support something that supports you right something you trust to support you a support structure of some kind right so for example um, before you sit on a chair, you you won't sit on a chair if you think it's going to break once you sit on it, right? You're only going to sit on a chair that you can you believe can hold you up, can support you, right? 
Um, and so you therefore have faith that when you sit on that chair, it's going to support you. Um, and uh, that's that's what we that's that's what faith really needs to be is that we we trust the Most High completely, implicitly, to um, to support us no matter what, uh, because He is actually the source of all of our um, everything we have. Everything He is the source of everything, um, not just what we have, but everything. He's the source of everything, so um, we should have complete and total trust in him trust or confidence um, almost to the point of uh almost to the point of arrogance i would say not in ourselves not in ourselves obviously um but in him uh yeah. you know it's, it's like it's like in psalms where he where he says um uh, let me make my boast with your inheritance right i, I believe that's psalm 116 um let me make my boast with your inheritance right um not in myself, but in in you, right? Yep. Um, and uh, that's that's something that's something he is something that we can always have complete and total trust in. And when we don't, as a matter of fact, it's actually whatever is not a faith is is uh, of sins, really, really. So yeah, I just wanted to to go ahead and clarify that because really the faith is. It's it's more than just oh I believe right it's it's more than just an intellectual assent right it's um it's being willing to um to put uh put your trust into something right oh I was trying to hang on there we go so absolutely brother you make this so easy. <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. You make this so easy for me. Oh man, <laughs> I, I would. Hey, look, ain't nobody else more. I would rather be doing this show with than you. Cause... Oh well, thanks, man. Thanks, really, seriously. Thank you. Ebony and Ivory, the Scripture Edition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, family. That's it. Y'all got anything? No, I'm good. <laughs> um, yeah, I do want to apologize for Shabbat talk not being on Shabbat, and it was actually um had to happen on New Moon Day. But this New Moon Day is a little special because it is the new beginning years. of a new year. Okay, mm -hmm. so for those of you guys who keep the Gregorian calendar, <laughs> you was way too early. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But with that being said, family, we don't got nothing, nothing else for you guys tonight. I appreciate you guys for coming out. For those of you guys who are watching the recording of this, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Drop a comment and tell us what you think or give us some topics that you'd like to cover. Although we are going through all of Paul's epistles for the remainder of the year. And now I can say the remainder of the year confidently. Yeah. <laughs> um, we will be taking, you know, breaks throughout the weeks and, and tackling other topics. We're going to be getting some speakers coming in. We're going to be doing some interviews. Mm -hmm. Truth Talk Radio. We're going to be doing some Truth Talk on here. Okay. We're going to be doing some things. And so we'll be having breaks and then coming back to the uh, Understanding Paul's Epistle series. So with that being said, family, if nothing else, we love you. Be safe. Have a blessed and joyful evening, bringing in the true biblical Enochian New Year yes. and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, <laughs> everyone. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Love you, family. Love you, Shabbat Shalom. Love you all so much. And happy shalom, New Year. Family. Love you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. A century and a half after the Constitution Indeed. abolished Indeed. slavery and guaranteed blacks the right to vote, four decades after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, voters have chosen our first African American president. Praise the Most High, Elohim of Heaven, peace to
to the brethren, I gotta ask a question Who ready to serve and demonstrate devotion? Because many are called, but only few are chosen Predestination's real, and gave me a task Spread his word to the four corners on the narrow path The Hamashiach came to restore the breach So I'm here to put in work, this my acceptance speech I appreciate the faith for putting all your trust in me I know Satan came to kill and steal, no burglary Sagal been stabbed in the back, no cutlery Been bleeding now slowly, shirts east shine burgundy I'm not your church or camp, they preach, but y'all heard crickets They said they came to serve, but sold you lies and wolf Tickets. But I'm here to make a difference Spread love, peace, and forgiveness Break the chains of bondage Cause hoes be locked up like a prison Leaders need to make a decision I wanna help someone avoid that life sentence Yeah, the most high is remarkable I thank him for anointing me For putting me in position Told the I before appointing me Praise the most high Elohim of heaven Peace to the brethren I gotta ask a question Who ready to serve? Demonstrate devotion because many are called, but only few were chosen. Predestination's real, he gave me a task. Spread his word to the four corners on the narrow path. The Hamashiach came to restore the breach. So I'm here to put in work, this my acceptance speech. Sometimes I feel unworthy when I think about the sin I've hauled. But he doesn't call a qualified, he qualifies the called. My words have reached the ears of so many different people. I pray they were inspired to be lights to the sheeple. To avoid propaganda, say no to the needle. To seek out truth and spread their wings, they flying like an eagle. Beware false teachers and understand that they words are see through. The pen of scribes are in vain and they doctrine. Sweet too. You need precision to put it into division You gotta cut out that sin like a surgeon makes an incision I'm here to learn from y'all just about as much as I teach He gave me the job, it's my acceptance speech Praise the most high, Elohim of heaven Peace to the brethren, I gotta ask a question Who ready to serve and demonstrate devotion Because many are called, but only few were chosen Predestination's real he gave me a task Spread his word to the four corners on the narrow path The Hamashiach came to restore the breach So I'm here to put in work, this my acceptance speech uh, There are many who won't agree with every decision or policy I make as president But I will always be honest with you about the challenges we face I will listen to you, especially when we disagree And those who tell us that we can't we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can.